written about 62 A.D., four chapters, 95 verses, 1998 words, and the theme of the book of Colossians is the deity of Christ. You're going to find out that the first chapter, Paul is going to be trying to establish and explain who Jesus is. Um, and that He is God manifest in the flesh. He's going to go to great lengths. There's some false doctrines that you're going to find in this church in chapter number 2 that's been creeping in. And uh, it's going to have to do with um, Gnosticism. You're going to see a lot of, you know, uh, that we can't really know some things for sure. Paul is going to deal with those false doctrines. And um, it's a good book when you're dealing with people surrounding the deity of Jesus Christ because he goes through great lengths to try to undo some of these false doctrines that are here. Look at uh, chapter 2 by way of introduction. You can see some of the things that uh, he's dealing with here. So these Gnostics are trying to lower the deity of Christ. They're trying to lessen him to a man. He's just a man and you can see him dealing with these issues uh, one by one. Look at verse number 7. He says, Rooted and built up in Him, speaking of Jesus Christ, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein, giving thanks. Notice, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Uh, And and we talked this morning about uh, folks who work with or go to school people who are involved in evolution, such, such as that. I'm around them all day long. Um, I'm very fortunate that there are some Christians that are around me. Um, but let me say this. It's nothing new. It, it, listen, the, the, the traditions of men, the philosophies of men, you know what? Uh, um, evolution is a philosophy. And listen, it takes a great amount of faith to believe that theory. People give us a hard time and say, hey, you know, uh, you believe in that, that, that Jesus was God manifest fest in flesh, he died for us. That's a, a large amount of faith. No, it takes an incredible amount of faith that you believe something came from nothing and there was nobody there to start it. That takes a lot of faith. For me, that takes an incredible, much more faith than I got because I, I, I have to admit, somebody had to start it. Listen, it takes an incredible amount of faith to believe that non-living, uh, non-living material can produce living material. Where does, the, where, does the, where does the time for it to happen come from? You say, you say billions of years, right? Where does it come from? Who, who gave the time? You've got to have time, space, and matter, right? You're, you're, you believe science, right? You believe science. So let me reason with you from a scientific standpoint. I like science. I, I'm, I'm not against science. I'm in favor of science. The kind that's testable and demonstrable. See, I can't demonstrate, uh, I can't demonstrate evolution in the lab. I can't demonstrate it. Okay? It's not testable or demonstrable. You have to have this pixie dust called billions of years for your theory to even work which you know none of us were there to even see it or observe it. So it had to happen. Why would I think something that could happen way back then couldn't happen now? Right? So where does the time come from? Where does the space come from? You got to have space to put something. Where does the matter come from? Where Where does the material come from for, did it just appear one day? Where, where does the energy to make things function come from? Where does the energy from the, where, that the sun has come from? Who sustains it? How does it get its energy? Where did the first energy for us to exist as living... We're here. Let's don't deny that, right? We're here. Where does the energy come for us to even exist? Listen, these things have been around for a long time, y'all. Paul is dealing with them at the Colossian church. This is it's nothing new that people would doubt the, the Word of God. We see him over there in the book of Acts 
reason with them. Acts chapter 17. Listen, people have always believed anything but there is a God who's in control. Okay? Listen, the, the thought is, either way the thought is scary, okay? Uh, and, and a lot of the, this quote, I wish I knew the name of the evolutionist that actually quoted this. I can't, his name's right on the tip of my tongue. But he made a statement that the, the possibility that there is a God is frightening but just as frightening as the possibility there's a God is the possibility that we're flying through the universe at thousands of miles an hour and nobody is in control. That's somebody who doesn't believe. Listen, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of sense in that statement. I just wish he would, he would realize that there is a God that's in control. Look at verse 17. So he deals with it again in verse 17 or 18. Let no man to beguile you uh, of your reward in a voluntary humility, worshiping of angels, intruding those things which he have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So he's dealing with multiple false doctrines here. Notice the, the worship of angels. There's only one person who's worthy of our worship, and that's God. So Jesus allowed worship of himself. God manifests in the flesh. Listen, so he's dealing with a multitude of, of false doctrines here. Now, Colossae was uh, set up on a rocky ridge that overlooked the valley of uh, Lyca, the Lycus River. It is 100 miles east of Ephesus. Okay, It is 12 miles north of Laodicea. This is going to be important because Laodicea, Colossae, and Herapolis you're going to see Paul talk about, they are actually sister, um, sister, um, what, do they, what do they call them? Cities? Uh, I'm thinking counties. I, I got a county stuck in my head. Sister cities, of those three, the, uh, they're, they're very high in the commerce. The whole area is supported by them. Colossae being the third ranked among the three, but they're, they're sister cities. They, they really they have a lot of fellowship with each other. You can see that um, the brethren in one area fellowship with those uh, other areas. But they're sister cities. So 12 miles north of Laodicea and uh, uh, 6.2 mi uh, miles south of Heropolis. So they're cities. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 13. We'll see how they're kind of needed together. Chapter 4, verse 13. Look at verse 12. Epaphras is, is one of you, a servant of Christ, salute you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all, with, uh, in all the will of God. For I bear him record, that he hath a great zeal for you, them that are in Laodicea and them that are in Herapolis. So we can see the... They're very close-knit cities, bordering cities, and they have a, a common bond here. And we can see, it doesn't appear that Paul actually went to Colossae. He's writing to them. Um, it, 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 it's, it almost seems to hint here that perhaps Epaphus went to one of these cities where Paul was preaching. Ephesus, one of those cities, got saved and brought the gospel back to um, Colossae. And we also see Timothy mentioned in verse number 1, so it appears that the two, two of them had some ties with this uh, city. And, but Paul himself, it does not appear that Paul himself actually went to any of these places. You can see by the way Paul uh, speaks. Look at chapter number 1. Chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, Timotheus our, and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all, uh, all the saints, for the hope which is 
uh, laid up for you in heaven. Notice Paul saying, we've heard. He's not saying, I came there and witnessed it, right? He's, look how he talks as he comes down. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you and is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit, as it uh, does also in you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us uh, uh, your love in the Spirit. Notice he's speaking as if Epaphras is there. He's, he's kind of a part, a center of that, like he was responsible for helping establish the church that's there. But he's not speaking as if he was there. He's just saying, hey, we've heard of this. We've, we've heard of what happened, right? Verse number 9, For this cause, since the day we heard it, uh, do not cease to pray for you, to desire that you might be uh, filled with knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Look at uh, chapter number 2, verse 1. Watch what Paul says here. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Paul is implying that he hasn't been there, or, or, or maybe he was there earlier, but there's no record of it, right? It appears that Epaphras, who was Paul's friend, we see him ministering to Paul's needs when he's in prison. He's there, he's a faithful minister. He is a part of this area, okay? And he knows these people much better than Paul does, and he's saying, look, there's people in Laodicea and Colossae that I haven't even seen their face. Okay, so it doesn't appear that Paul was ever at uh, Colossae. Look at, uh, well, we read chapter number 4 and saw the influence of Epaphras and how he, uh, in chapter 4, begins to explain that he, it appears that he's not even there. Okay, um, he doesn't mention that he knows any of these uh, places personally. Now, another thing that we find at uh, the church at Colossae, we find that it's made up of what appears to be uh, majorly or uh, mostly Gentiles. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. As he begins to explain to them what Jesus Christ has done. Chapter 1 and 2, he in great detail about how Jesus Christ took away our sin. He removed the handwriting and ordinances that were against us. By the time you get to chapter 3 and 4, he's encouraging us to live for him. Okay, Look at uh, uh, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins, and the what? Uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespass. Now listen, he wouldn't be talking about the uncircumcision of the flesh if he was talking to Jews, right? So it seems that the majority here are Gentiles. Right? Because it, 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 if he said that to a Jew, uh, the light switch is going off automatically. The Jews are not going to want to hear it. They're circumcised because it was, it was what God gave to them as a sign. So it would appear that by the illustration that he's given here, because he's not talking about a spirit, even though he's talking about a spiritual circumcision, he's addressing people who in the flesh have not been circumcised. You know that he, they're majority Gentiles. Because the Jew is, they're going to be ardent about that, okay? So, with that introduction, that's the introduction to the book of Colossians. Let's start in verse number 1, see if we can get into the meat of some of this today. <clears throat> we won't even get past verse number 1 today. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to Motheus our brother. Now, we need to talk about something that's mentioned in verse number 1, that word apostle, okay? It's someone who sent uh, a messenger. It's, it's what an apostle is. Now, most people think about the 12, and I believe the 12 are apostles, right? Paul, Paul is an apostle, right? But we need to look at what qualifies a person as an apostle. Let me say this. You got a lot of people walking around now, and uh, Job said, I've learned not to give flat, flattering titles to men, right? 
you got a peop people walking around who desire a title. And so when you, you talk to them, it's almost like a boastful thing. I am, I'm a deacon, you know, right? I, I'm, a, I'm the apostle so-and-so. Listen, I'm pastor, but there's no need for me to capitalize that, right? There's no need for that. Listen, I'm not a reverend. There's only one that's worthy of reverence, and that's God. I don't like being called reverend. You've got to be careful about those titles. So Those titles belong to God. Listen, listen when you're talking about uh, Holy Father, Rome calls uh, the Pope Holy Father. There's only one Holy Father. We should not be calling men. We should not be concerned about the titles. God gave some gifts. He doesn't capitalize it. You don't see Paul capitalizing, or, or I, I'm not saying that that, listen to me, I'm not saying that that's what I'm trying to get you to see is the position that God gave us in the body is not something we should boast about. It is God who chooses, it is God who uh, appoints, and it's not us. And if it is us, we're wrong, Right? So the term apostle, you'll hear a lot of people use the term apostle. And I'll say this, um, there, there's nobody nowadays who would qualify to hold the term. Nobody who would qualify because of the specifics that are given. Let's look at some of that. Um, nothing like the Word of God to correct some error. And not listen to me. People take that term and they use it. I don't despise them because... I believe it's a misunderstanding of the Word of God. I believe that, that God is still using some of them in spite of the fact that they're taking that term, right? Um, because they just don't know, and, and, and I believe they're ministers, and they really are trying with the, all their heart, but they just don't, they don't have the knowledge. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. 1 Corinthians 4. It says, Who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou thou uh, didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Did I give the right chapter? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, okay? Look at verse number 8. Now are ye fool, now are ye rich. Ye have uh, uh, reigned as kings without us. I would, God, that ye... Would to God ye did reign, uh, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us apostles. Notice how Paul is speaking. Us apostles. It's a fellowship that is, you're going to see other apostles are going to speak the same way. It's a fellowship that is common where he's at that time period. You know, the apostles didn't exist. Uh, the, that term, you can't find it in the Old Testament, Right? So they were raised up for a specific purpose. Look at this. As it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. Let me say something to you. That title apostle, or that, that whatever you want to say, the, the, the position God has given, Paul says he raised us up for a specific purpose. Do you see what his purpose is? He said he raised us up for what? Death. He raised us up on purpose to give our lives. Look at this. Watch what he says again. For I think that God has set forth us apostles last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle to the world and, an, uh, and to angels and to men. So, listen, let me say something to you about an apostle. You're willing to take that title. Let me say something to you. God raised up the apostles for spectacles to the whole world and appointed unto death. Okay? So, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Paul, his apostleship is being questioned. Look at what he says here. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen? Look, look what Paul brings up. Now this is, is important. I want you to see this. Have I not seen our Lord? Now notice what's being questioned. His apostleship, right? Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? 
Have I not seen our Lord? Are, are, are not ye my uh, work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you, for the zeal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Notice his apostleship's being questioned. Notice one thing he brings up. Why does he bring that up? Do you see what one thing he brings up? Have I not seen our Lord? The apostleship, as you, you're going to see, is associated with people who were there. Look, turn to Acts chapter 1. Watch Peter begin to explain this apostleship and, and the qualifications of the man they had to pick to replace Judas. They had to pick somebody to replace Judas. In picking somebody to replace Judas, the same thing that Paul just told you is one of the requirements. Look at this. Acts chapter number 1. Look at verse 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren. Notice these are, what are these called? This 120, what are they called? He doesn't refer to them as apostles. He calls them disciples. But they're going to get together and guess what they're fixing to pick? An apostle to replace Judas to fulfill Scripture. So Peter is going to talk about the qualifications to be an apostle. Look at this. Men and brethren, the Scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us. See the term again? How he, how he listen, I believe Luke wrote the book of Acts. See how he brings up the same thing that Paul is bringing up the, uh, uh, among us apostles? And so Luke brings it up again here. Well, actually it's Peter speaking, right? Verse number 17, For he was numbered with us and obtained part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, Falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as um, that field is called in a proper tongue, a seldom, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let, uh, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. You say, what's a bishopric? Just hold on a minute. Okay? Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord dwelt uh, within and uh, out among us, let's read that again. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Notice, you see this? It's a person who had to exist during the time period of Jesus Christ. He's given the qualifications. Look, we need to go back to John's baptism, right? Right? And they had to be a testimony of Jesus and a witness of Him and a witness of His resurrection. Okay? Verse number 23, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, whose name was Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, uh, show whither of, the two, uh, of these two uh, thou hast chosen that he may t uh, take part of this ministry, and what? All right, so bishopric is a ministry and an apostleship. Okay, it's a ministry. Okay? From which Judas, uh, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. You see that? So, uh, the replacement there for Judas. Now, watch how they did it. Interesting, I'm just going to bring up something, a little side note, something the Lord showed me here a couple weeks back, and they gave uh, forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Isn't it something? 
Isn't it something? A lot of people say, well, I don't believe in voting in church. Well, you tell me what giving a lot is. They're not casting them, so they're not rolling dice. They're giving a lot. I don't believe in voting in church. Okay, that's fine. I'm not. People get caught up with the craziest things, don't they? You say whatever you want to say. You may not believe in voting, but somehow there has to be order in a church, regardless of how you do it. And here they're giving lots. They're writing. Pe- Listen, it appears a lot. It's something written on a piece of paper, or and they put it in a vase and they would cast it out, or a piece of wood they would put it on a vase and cast it out. Or it it could be, I guess, rolling dice if you cast them, something along that line. But it appears they wrote something on a piece of wood, a name or something, put it in a vase, and and, and that's how they would cast lots. But here they're not casting them. They're giving them. Right? I'm just throwing this little side note. (laughs) Just something I ran across here a while back. There there is some. Listen, okay, Acts 7. They chose what we we refer to as the deacons. How do they choose them? The apostle said, I want you to narrow it down to seven people. I want you to pick seven people. I don't know how many was there. 500. I don't know. 100. 50. But they said, I want you, of all the group you got, I want you to pick seven. So they set the order. How did they, how did they, how did they establish that? Did they vote? You tell me. I'm just saying. Listen, there has to be some order, but here we see we see that they are giving their lot in an, uh, and the lot, the multitude of lots, fell on Matthias, and it was considered one lot when they were done. There was no division after this. There was no uproar. There was no fussing and fighting. The church was still unified, and they still loved each other. Yeah, you know what? You're, yeah, I need to go look at that because it does it say they cast them or do they? Did they? Yeah. Sure. What I thought was interesting here, it says they gave forth their lots. So whatever they got here, a lot. If you look, uh, just dictionary wise, I, I did a little research on it. It was something written on a. They would write it on a wood or a piece of something that they had, whatever they had, and they would just put it in a vase and, you know. But this, that's casting them. Here they're saying they gave them. So I I don't know. It it appears to be voting to me. I'm not going to get it. I don't even care. Does it even matter? If we can have a discussion and, 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 and establish things with the church with a discussion, that's not a problem. But what do you do when there's a disagreement? Like people don't agree with things. Well, one person has to step. Okay, wh- how do you pick the person who steps in? I, I'm just saying, I, I don't disagree with you, brother. I don't disagree with you. But what happens when you pray and fast and people are still at disagreement? What happens when you pray and fast and one person said, I prayed and fasted, and, and I don't agree with what you say, and the other person said, I pray and fasted, and I don't agree with what you say? What do you do then? But I'll say this, in a church... There needs to be unity. There needs to be unity. All I'm trying to say is uh, we, we, we run across people who say we don't believe in vote. We don't, okay, that's fine. Whatever. It, it's neither here nor there. Neither here nor there. But we've got to have some order in a church. Okay, back to the apostles thing. Notice they had to be witnesses of qualification, witnesses of his resurrection. So let me ask you something. Why, based on the qualifications we've seen so far, does anybody nowadays qualify to be an apostle? No. But let me say something to you. There were more than the 12. You guys do know that. There were more than the 13 if you had, uh, uh, Jude, uh, 14 if you had Judas and Paul, even though uh, I believe Matthias was a replacement. But the Bible does speak of, of other apostles. Um, let's look at um, Acts chapter number 14. Acts 14. Acts chapter 14. There are some verses that are a little bit foggy, uh, whether it's speaking of um, the particular people that are there, but I want to give you some clear ones. These are, these are the ones that I, I believe are, this one in particular is probably the clearest one. 
Acts 14, 14. Uh, you remember Paul here, let's look at verse 11. And when the people saw Paul, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called uh, Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and would have done sacrifice with the people. Look at verse 14. Which when the apostles, look, apostles, comma, who's included here that's not one of the twelve? Barnabas and Paul heard of it. They rent their clothes and ran among the people, crying out, and so on and so forth. So we, we see Paul um, and Barnabas, Barnabas an apostle. Look, look at Acts cha- or, um, Galatians chapter 1, Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1. Here's another one. These are the two clearest ones. There's some that the way the wording is, some people said that it's not talking about the individuals, it's talking about the apostles and these individuals. But these are clear. Okay, now watch this. But of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now we know of James that wrote the book of James, right? We, we know of James, the, <laughs> one of the apostles, one of the twelve. This right here is James, the Lord's brother. James, the brother of John, we know the fisherman. Well, I, I'll say this, the book of James, I think that was written by <laughs> James, the Lord's brother, right, James. But it might have been the apostle, James. We'll go over that, we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, notice this, James, the one James, was Peter, James, and John, right? The one that was killed in Acts chapter number 12, right? That James, okay? So, but this one is James, the Lord's brother. So here's a, another apostle outside the 12, okay? And the Bible speaks of this one. The Lord had more than this one brother, you do know that, right? James, Joseph... Are not these his sisters? He had brothers and sisters, okay? So, but let's look at this. So, there's more than 12 apostles, but we saw the qualifications of those apostles. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter 3. So, there's more than 12 apostles, but the qualifications is they had to be there to witness the resurrection of the Lord. They had to... uh, be there since John's baptism, we see, okay? Let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter number 3, and says the second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you that I'm both I, uh, which I, I, I'm sorry, chapter 3, yeah, there we go. That you may be mindful of the words, let's go back. The second epistle, beloved, I, uh, I now write unto you, I, uh, both in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Notice he's saying of us. He's speaking of somebody in his time period, us. We've already seen the qualification there. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians. Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12, look at verse number 12, notice what he says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in uh, signs and wonders and in mighty deeds, so the signs of an apostle. They were associated with signs. Now we notice, notice this uh, in the time period. You see those signs fading away. And along with that fading away was the apostleship, right? Because listen, who required a sign? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians uh, in chapter number 1, verse 22, 
The Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. So those sign gifts were done, even though there were Gentiles present, present and the Lord used them, it was for the Jews. It was to manifest to them uh, a, a particular thing. The Bible says the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews require a sign, okay? So what we see is this apostleship, along with those signs, because the Jew, who rejected? The Jews re rejected. Gentiles begin to be grafted in. So what you see is those signs failing. You say, no, I'm going to tell you what. Do you not remember people being left sick that Paul could not heal? Why didn't he heal them? Peter had a mother-in-law. She was sick. Why didn't he heal her? You think about that? Listen, those signs were there to start the ministry, to get that ministry going. Not that I remember. I don't see, see no record of her being healed. Do you, was she healed? That's right. That's it. That's the one I'm thinking about right there. You, you're probably right. She was healed. She was healed. That's right. Yeah, he was trying to keep her sick. That's right, she was healed. You're right, absolutely right. No, no, Mama, I, I appreciate you saying that. But, um, but notice those signs are failing. And, and because the Jews require a sign, those signs are, are, are waning away. Now, listen, the Bible speaks in the book of Joel about those signs coming back. I'm not against any of that. Listen, I believe the Jews are going to be grafted back in, and, and there's going to be some incredible things that happen on this earth, right? But we see a time period when those signs begin to fade away, the apostleship with it, okay, because all the people who would have witnessed his resurrection would be dead, okay? With that said, Paul gives us a warning, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11. Verse number 13. He says, for such are what? False apostles, deceitful workings, transforming themselves into the what? Apostles of Christ, no marvel for Satan himself transform as an angel of light, no great things as ministers, so on and so forth. There's a false apostles. Even in Paul's day, there was already false apostles. There was already people professing to be something that they were not. Now, am I saying everybody who takes this particular title, turn to Ephesians 4, we're close right here, is, you know, wicked. No, I'm saying this. A lot of them may not even realize that it's not even a it's not even a term that you could apply to yourself because you don't meet the qualifications of it, right? It's, it's you know, you, you're probably some type of, in some type of ministry, you probably should be a, a if you're not a woman, be a pastor, right? Or uh, um, some type of minister, an evangelist, or something like that. Those are, are titles that are still around and didn't have those restraints put on them other than you see the qualifications of a, a, a a bishop in uh, sec, uh, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, chapter three, no, Second Timothy, chapter three. Okay, so let's look at this. The Bible says in verse eleven, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So notice, there's a particular order. You say, well. Um, he only gave a certain amount. Well, he only gave one of his son. That's how narrow he is. He only gave one of his son, and he's the only way. So why, why, would, why would that bother you that he gave certain things for a time period, and then he was done with it, right? Because, listen, we see before the apostles, there are none. So why not have them all? It's, it's for a time period what I'm trying to get you to see. God uh, allowed them for a time period for a specific purpose 
and they knew, listen, you see them doing exactly what God said they would do, and that is they would give their life. James is killed in Acts chapter number 12. John is, he, he's, listen, if you read the uh, historical account of John, it's horrific, but he's banished to this Isle of Patmos, suffering, and, and should have been killed. You know, Paul the Apostle was stoned multiple times, left for dead, and, and it was just a grace of God. You see these folks being persecuted, and doing exactly what Paul said that they would do, which is they would have to give their lives. Okay, And it's to ground the gospel. It's to get things grounded and, and, and get believers in the church and to manifest that God is who he says he is. So it's, it's the foundation. Notice Jesus is a cornerstone and those apostles is, is a foundation. You know who wrote uh, the New Testament? It's those apostles, right? So he used them in trying to get the word of God grounded and settled and into the communities and out eventually into the world. Amen? All right, we're going to stop right there. Take a break.